All right, good morning, NOVA fans, and happy Tuesday. My name is Gina Varamo, and I'm the Outreach Manager for NOVA. Thank you for joining us today for the first virtual field trip in our Backyard Farm to Table series. With COVID-19 forcing families to stay home, many people are turning to their backyards for valuable time outdoors and a new hobby at home. And whether you have a green thumb or you have no idea where to start, this virtual field trip series will review the ins and outs of vegetable gardening, from setting up your space to the science behind some of our most popular summer flavors. But today, we're really excited to start at the beginning, the very beginning of your gardening journey. Maybe you have some beds at home that you've, you know, messed around with once or twice, but need some serious TLC, or you wanna try and build a raised bed, but you're not sure what you need. Or maybe you live in a city and you don't have much green space, but you have a deck or a really sunny window. And no matter your situation, our guests, Nataka Creighton Walker and Bobby Walker from the Urban Farming Institute of Boston are here to help. Nataka is a farmer and manager at the Urban Farming Institute and empowers residents to grow their own food and cook healthy meals as a part of, as a path to healthier living. And Bobby is a farmer and the farmer training manager at the Urban Farming Institute and has provided training for more than 100 new and upcoming farmers through UFI's different training programs. So throughout the broadcast, if you have any questions for Nataka and Bobby about setting up your space, about different plants, please feel free to put them in the comments, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, and we'll try to get to as many as possible during our time together. So Nataka and Bobby, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Your farm is absolutely beautiful. Thank you for your time. Welcome to Welcome, the farm. Everybody. How's it going? It's kind of cloudy out here. But uh, it's lovely. So yeah, we just wanted to take you um, a walk around the farm just to see what the Urban Farming Institute does and grows. And then we're going to take you to a small special place so that we can, because we started off as gardeners, so where we can kind of show you some techniques and what we do to set up small scale gardening. Sounds good. Cool. You want to say anything Yeah. Take a walk. Around. All right. So this is our okra section over here. The okra and green beans, actually, some green beans down there, too. Yeah, yeah. Tomato area right here. Looking, if you look inside there, we finally got some uh, tomatoes growing. So if it's not quite hot where you're at, really hot, it's hot here. They need at least over 80 degree temperature to really start turning turning red. So our tomatoes are turning red and we're very, very excited. excited. <laughs> so we have all kinds of stuff growing. We have um, herbs, everything from chives to scallions, um, sage, you name it, we, we almost- Probably got it, if yeah. it's a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, and this space is really special. We moved in here 2018 officially. So it was the first time um, since we incorporated in 2012 that we actually have our own headquarters. So this is the Fowler Clark Epstein farm and there's our barn. And then this is the, uh, both of these are historic sites. Yeah, so the house was built in 1786 and then the barn was built in 18, 18, oh. <laughs> I can't even. <laughs> so the barn is really cool. Hopefully one day you guys will get a chance on another series to come and actually look at our teaching kitchen. So we have a teaching kitchen in there where we have folks come and educate people about fresh produce. We actually have uh, on August, I think, 15th, we have a jelly jams and jelly session. It'll all be on Zoom, but um, it happens too, usually right here in our barn. We do different things. We do things like um, food is medicine, um, because food is medicine. And what else? Mushrooms, how to grow your own mushrooms. Um, growing food without a, a formal garden, because some people have small, really small spaces. Their cement driveways or their, their um, balconies. And so it's a really good time to kind of learn what materials that you can use um, to really create your own small, small garden, grow. Yeah. But it's pretty diverse here. Very diverse. We have lots of berries. So I was wanted to make up a song. First come strawberries, then come blueberries, then come red raspberries and blackberries. And there goes Nubia. That's our farm That's cat. That's our farm cat. <laughs> so, yeah, she likes to be in our uh, camera too. Mm -hmm. 
We have a it's lot of not a real farm if you don't have a barn cat. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, let us um kind of take, take you to the back. So like when you had those like huge fields of tomato plants and ochre plants, how many plants are actually in there? Oh, oh there's at least a hundred plants in that area. And then um at our other site, we probably got another 200 plants. Did you start yeah. them from seed? Oh yeah, we started them all from seed, from in the greenhouse. We started okay. um, growing all that stuff in March. Great, cool. Yeah, and the cool thing about um, everything we grow, so we have a farm stand that we do every year, and then we also give away food to um, a special veterans program. And then actually this year, because of COVID, during our, our farm stand, it's pay as you can. So just to make sure that nobody goes without food if they need food. So we get a lot of poundage. And this year we kind of made a decision that um, we're either going to sell food or we're going to give it or we're going to give it away. And so we select to primarily give it away. So we got a lot of tomatoes coming and uh, cucumbers, cute. squash, peppers. We have sweetened hot peppers. Um, yeah, we got Kalaloo. <laughs> so I don't know if you guys know what Kalaloo is, but there's this is wild plant some of them are smaller than others so now this year they just kind of come up on their own but they're really nutritious they're the amaranth family mm. and basically if you've ever eaten quinoa yes they all related. this is uh and this is what they might look like in your backyard and they you they're edible and they actually are more in uh, more nutrient nutritious. value than um spinach kale and collard greens so they're really really uh, omegas Lots of great stuff in them. But yeah, we try to diversify, you know, with flowers and we leave those because we eat those. <laughs> so those are the things that don't get weeded here. Yeah. They used to be considered weeds though. Oh uh, yeah, don't get me started on that. But yeah, so. <laughs> we operated for years without a greenhouse. So this year was the first time we were able to get a greenhouse. But what I would say is um, starting off small is, 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 is the best place to be because it allows you to learn and grow and be innovative. Um, we constructed little, before we had a greenhouse, we constructed little small enclosures so that um, we could grow, still keep growing in the wintertime and then also harden plants off, plants off as they came out of the greenhouse. So start off small, end up bigger. <laughs> so cool, let's take you back here. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, so obviously in starting any kind of backyard growing, you just really want to think about what kind of space you want or, or have available to you, but then not just that, also where your sun is. There's a couple of apps that you can get off of the Google store um, that kind of has a, a compass, is it compass? <laughs> yeah, to, uh, to let you know whether or not yeah, your sun, sun is, is yeah. Coming in yeah, where you get the most sun at. So. Um, the best case scenario is that once you figure out where your south side is, that's generally where you want to put your, your biggest plants would be facing. So say this was the south, the tomatoes and peppers, they need a lot of sun. And so once you figure that out, um, so it's really, yeah, what kind of space you, um, how much space you have, what kind of thing you're going to grow them in, and there's lots of things to grow plants in. So here we have, we have, um, here we have lettuce. We have kale, this is a lacinato kale, and then we have a couple of collard greens. Yeah, so the other thing, if you're doing boxes, um, everything needs its own space. There's a bug? Yeah, that's a <laughs> cucumber beetle. Oh, they eat your cucumber They eat your cucumber stems. plants and stems. <laughs> so yeah, bugs are definitely, maybe that's a couple of questions that people might have when they come on. So you're not just thinking about space, but you're also thinking about space needs of each plant. So. With tomatoes that can sometimes grow and as you guys saw in the front there they can grow like four feet wide so you want to make sure that you give them a good amount of space peppers can be spaced out a little uh a little more um yeah about 18 inches apart and then i always like to put my favorite herbs so i'm about to put in some scallions um and some onions and yeah a few other things but i like to put in kind of everything I want like in a salad or in a dish or that I use regularly. So that 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 will probably be another thing, like grow what you eat and you know what you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And start off 
and start off small, you know, and don't be afraid to try. So um, the cool thing about these beds, there's only, what is, how big are these? These are three feet. Three feet by three feet? Yeah. So like for collard greens, um, they need about 12 square foot of space because they can grow pretty tall and a little wide. You want to make sure that you give them proper spacing. Um, lettuce as well, at least a good square foot um, of space. Um, and then in a few weeks, these will be all big and uh, grown. Oh my goodness. So did you see that moth over there? So that moth is really pretty and everybody thinks it's a butterfly, but it's called a cabbage moth. And what it does is it delivers on your greens in the back, sometimes you'll find holes. So I don't know if you growers have ever seen holes, but they deliver this worm, this lovely green worm. A little light green caterpillar that just chews oh, those leaves yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we're gonna let and, it do its thing for right now. And he's laying eggs right now. And she's <laughs> laying eggs right now. Literally. <laughs> Yeah, and also, so my, the squash plant here is not uh, very happy because I transplanted it, so hopefully it recovers. I gave it some water. But squash is another one of those plants that usually have very large leaves. Um, yeah, and I was telling the team this morning, this we planted this one squash that, because of it was early, we didn't know which squash, kind of squash it was. It was. And so come to find out, it's, it's uh, butternut. butternut, which is a winter squash. And they're humongous. Fine. So space is obviously uh, important. The good thing about these kind of things, though, if you have enough space that allow you to grow up, then you can always trellis. And mm. so trellising, because they have these little fingers that kind of look to to um, wow. to grab onto something. And so if you had something that you could trellis them on, they'll grab right onto that and grow up instead of going out, which saves space in your small small garden. What are some plants that are better that grow up versus grow out? Like, what would you use a trellis for? So you would trellis your cucumbers. We trellis our tomatoes. Um, squash is definitely something you could trellis. Peas. Peas. Yep. Pole beans. Um, yeah, that's pretty much oh, melons. Wait, melons. Yeah, we did that with melons yep. too. Um, cantaloupe and um, watermelons. Yep. Yep. Do they get to see that they pull the trellis down? Um, no, strange. they didn't pull the trellis down. But what happened was um, when the fruits were ripe, they would um, because they were growing up. But when they were ripe, they would fall off and they would be at the bottom of the plant. Oh, okay. So it was, that was the funniest thing that would happen here. Yeah, so obviously whatever you're using for staking, um, the lighter staking is for like peas and stuff, but like if it's squash and things like that, we usually get like really big steaks like these. From, you can get them from like Lowe's, mm -hmm. um, but if you get steaks like these, you can put two steaks side by side. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna string those two steaks up because I'm gonna plant some peas. Mm -hmm. um, these are um, among the things that you can grow now. So I'm going to create uh, a little trellis. You don't have to buy one. You can make them. Um, people make them out of old broomsticks. Yeah. Um, tools that yeah. lost their heads. You go over there and make a trellis. Oh. Because they have a trellis. So this is an example of the trellis that we would put up for like cucumbers. These are actually cucumbers that are growing on here. Oh, great. And that's just like two wood stakes with some like twine, just kind yep. of like tied together. Yep. That's exactly what that is. That's awesome because I think a lot of people also get into gardening and it's so easy to walk into like Lowe's or Home Depot and you see, you know, these like huge contraptions or like expensive pieces of equipment, but like all you need is two sticks and some string and you can get yourself some peas. Definitely. <laughs> exactly. Definitely. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I wanted to show you guys a few other things that um, in terms of grow beds, but I guess because we're on the topic of uh, things that you can kind of trellis and grow now. Um, so these are things that you can actually start thinking about growing now and the late garden. This is the, the broccoli's a little, a little a tiny late. Yeah. Cauliflower, though, yeah, potentially. So, um, onions, which these are actually like scallions, they're not the big onions. Yeah. Big onions take a little bit more time. You could probably get a few, a few 
few more rounds in of your your garden beans, green beans or yellow wax beans. Um, we have mustard. Um, I did have yep beets. beets. Yep, peas. Peas are definitely something. Peas are definitely something. Right Lettuce is something you can um, plant now. Turnips, and if you like those tops for soups and stuff, or stir fries, um, radishes, and carrots, kind of, sort of. Almost like the broccoli is a kind of, sort of, if you have enough time, but I would try it anyway. Um, yeah, so definitely lots of stuff that can still be planted now in August. And we just want to show you. Oh, you got to do that. Yeah. So you can grow in all kinds of stuff. So if you don't have the raised beds or access to wood or you know can't afford to buy wood, um, there's grow bags, which are relatively cheap, and you can pretty much grow anything in those grow bags. That is a is a eggplant. And even your tomatoes and your peppers, they don't they don't need a lot of root room. Um, because their roots can tend to like grow outwards, which is really good because they don't really need more than like six inches of, um, of soil. So even a small bag like that, you know, as heavy as your eggplant can be, it's still able to really hold um, everything that you need. It also is really good for holding water. It uh, retains water very well. Um, and again, if you could put salad mix, that was another thing you could totally do, salad mix. Um, but like pots, I keep my, my herbs in pots. So these are different varieties of, of mint. Well, I have mint other places, but um, one's an apple mint and I forget the other one. Um, but yeah, I usually pot, keep, keep things, put, things go really well in pots. Herbs, spices, all that stuff grows really, really well in pots. So, um, and I just put a few things over here. So pot, so even though I used a grow bag, essentially what you can do is grab a barrel. Um, it could be this size or this size. Because as you saw from this little grow bag, you could put an eggplant in here. And you just put a bunch of holes on the bottom and on the sides just to let the water go out. But you could totally use buckets. Um, I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm kind of, kind of weird. I'm kind of like a, a, a pot bucket person. So even though we have some space to grow stuff, I really love to grow things in, in buckets and, um, and in pots. Are there things that, are, that lend themselves better to growing in buckets and pots than in like a bed? Not in particular. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the only thing you might be worried about is just fertilization, um, mm -hmm. because usually, I mean, and it, drainage. It, and drainage, yeah. Drainage is key for like any um, anything, any type of bucket you want to use, especially because they're plastic. You definitely want to have drainage because it will hold water and then rot out the roots. Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay. but if you have really good compost, either way, it, 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 it'll be great. The only thing about growing in beds like this is that they can't pull up like the nutrients from, from below. So you always wanna make sure that you get a good quality compost, mm. preferably from a, a local farmer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, but any other kind of place like Lowe's, um, et cetera. But yeah, so that's kind of what we got for you guys. And we're definitely hoping to be able to answer any questions for new growers, um, a little more experienced growers that might be having some challenges with things and just wanna tap into whatever little resource we might have available. Yeah, we have a bunch of questions. Um, before we get to some of the audience questions, so audience, continue to put your questions in the comments. Um, we're gonna get to them in a bit. I wanna know, how do you go about building the bed? So like, what's the process for building a raised bed? That's so funny. I know, I we should oh, have almost like funny. waited to. I know it's a build one, but uh, let me, I'm just, I'll yeah, lay, maybe I'll lay one out real Yeah, quick. ask 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 another question. Hopefully he doesn't leave and, and you ask me something that I, I'm not familiar with. <laughs> okay, I'll ask another question in the meantime. Um so we have someone, Ana Aceves, wants to know um what are some tips or suggestions for easy things to grow for beginners? Easy things to grow for beginners. Huh, I was gonna say not herbs. Um basil's a pretty easy um one to grow. Huh? Radishes, beans, Radishes, beans. Uh, lettuce is pretty easy to grow. Um, I think even kale and collard greens are easy because um, even though they need water, they don't require like a lot of water, but I definitely say lettuce. Um, herbs are a little more challenging except basil because they're really hardy. They're kind of almost like bushes. Mm -hmm. So um, you might want to be a little patient with your scallions are pretty easy and chives 
and they like to grow close close together. Um, cilantro also likes to grow close together. You just drop those seeds. It needs very little soil on top. Um, but I love cilantro. I always say, no cilantro, no vive, which you know, no cilantro, no life. Um, but cilantro is definitely one of those things that are easy to grow. Um, yeah, I think that's a good a good start. So we have someone who also loves growing herbs in pots. Moving Book from YouTube wants to know, I've been doing herbs in pots outside the last few years and it's so fantastic. My issue is I miss them in the winter. Advice if I can bring them inside or can't bring them inside? You totally could bring them inside. The other thing about that is, is that it really depends on how much light you have. Mm -hmm. So at that point that you're bringing stuff inside because of it being outside and the days being shorter, plants automatically want to shut down. Mm -hmm. So with the shorter hours a day, that's when they want to go to sleep. So when you bring your herbs in, you want to make sure you have it in a lit up place. Or if you have a grow light, you want to kind of give it the extra hours that it needs. How many hours of light would you say it needs? Like, so say during the winter, we get what, like maybe eight hours of six to eight hours of light. Would you want to have that yes. grow on so it gets like a full 12 hours or how long? Pretty much, exactly. So it would probably be like, if you have, you really want to be range around 12 to 14 hours. But if you're so, but if you're, if you're growing inside, you want to at least have, if you're going to, have it out a window, you just want to add those extra hours at the end of the day. Mm. Yeah, that extra four or five hours that it might need. So mm -hmm. say it gets, um, the sun comes up at, we'll say eight, and it goes down at four, you want to put another four hours on it. Cool. Um, also related to growing in pots, so I know we have some viewers that just have a window. So maybe it's not necessarily, they might not be outside, but it might be in their house in a window. Can you yeah. still grow, you know, an eggplant in a window, like even if it's not outside, or are you kind of a bit more limited to what you can grow? You're a bit more limited. And I would say what you would want to grow is leafy greens. You wouldn't <laughs> want to grow anything that's going to grow a fruit out of it because it's you actually need a pollinator. Right. So anything that's going to grow fruit, you need it needs to be pollinated. Mm -hmm. um, so, but if you're growing like a salad, greens, or um, so a lot of herbs, you basil. can just basil, cilantro, parsley, um, all those things you can grow in the house very easily in a window. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. lettuce is another one, arugula. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have, we also have a very popular question that's come in a few times. What are some best practices for natural pest control and how do you handle pests on the farm? Oh yeah, that's a great question. I'll first, I'll first say, cause I know, I know you have a lot more experience in this than I do, but biodiversity is very key. So having a different variety of plants and herbs and sometimes weeds um, is really crucial because they all invite different types of pollinators, different types of things that eat other things. Um, and without that, you kind of have a monocrop. Um, and so anything that's going to get that thing, it's going to be even more susceptible to, um, to getting it um, if it's just, you know, one crop. So our theory is like, um, we do a couple of different things. So one thing that we do with all our, like, it depends on which pest it is. So like, for instance, when we're growing our salad mix, we have um, these little pests called flea beetles, which are arch nemesis. Um, but well, every time we plant, there's a couple of things we do. Every time we plant uh, our salad mix, we plant a roll of dill down the middle. Now, dill is a strong smelling herb that mm. attracts a predatory fly. So the idea of what we're trying to do is attract the predators to keep the pest in check. So another wow. thing with um, tomatoes, when we're growing our tomatoes, we always place some basil along the sides. Now that protects marigolds and basil. Um, now that protects it 
actually brings in a predatory, um, a parasitic wasp because every year we get this, uh, actually we found one yesterday, a uh, tomato hornworm, which if you've ever found one of those tomato hornworms on you, it will freak you out it because will. It, they're bigger than my finger. And if you it, turn them around, their mouths are like round and then they have teeth going all the all way, way inside, in like some kind of sea creature. Yeah. Or it's not yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> So the, so the basil helps with that? Yeah, the basil helps attract the predatory wasps. And I used to I used to kill them, but now I don't because they end up being a habitat for something else. So I've learned. You don't have to kill everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think also um, for the must, for the greens and stuff, would you guys you lay over um, a barrier? Oh, yeah. Also, another thing that we do is when we're um, planting any greens, we have um, this fabric. We have a, a landscape white fabric that we put over when we're first starting these plants out. And that helps protect them from the pests and it helps them grow out big enough for them to actually flourish. <laughs> <laughs> You're so silly. Like, oops, sorry, babe. <laughs> So cool. Do you wanna you wanna see uh before we get to other questions, you wanna see how he puts the he put these beds together? Yeah, please, let's do it. So I basically have my four boards that I cut down. And um what I do is just flip them all up. And then I screw them all together and fill them in. Yeah, and it's what we, we really also simple. have is um a black fabric. So that we yeah, usually put on the bottom. Yeah. When we install them into people's houses, I put this, um, we have a black fabric, landscape fabric, which I don't see right now, but we have a black fabric that we put down because of all our sites and everything that we do, we have to have, um, because the soil might not be, the soil might be contaminated. Mm -hmm. So you want to actually make sure that you have new soil that's clean soil. Right. And it's not touching the old soil. So we put a, a landscape fabric at the bottom of each one of these beds and then refill. Yeah, and if you have a space that's like, um, say, on um, cement or in your driveway, um, it's also good so that it helps uh, retain moisture so that you don't, and also just not, you don't lose a lot of the soil from um, the bottom of your, of your beds. So it has multiple purposes. And definitely for people who don't like to weed, um, weeding is another another thing. Like we use like hay. Um, what else do we? We also grow things very close together, so yeah. we can't really uh, penetrate as easily. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but definitely it's good for uh, preventing weeds. Yep. So cool. Any um, other questions? Yeah. If you're building, if you're building a raised bed like this, do you need to have? Can you just keep your like, you know, regular lawn underneath or do you need to do any sort of like, you know, prep yeah. to the space before you build the bed? No, you can keep whatever is there because you're building over whatever is there. Cool. Yeah, the only thing I, I would say that if, if it's uneven, you may have to, to, uh, level, to it level it out. Um, but that, That's it, it. It, it, yeah, other than that. Yeah. Yep. And especially if you have that landscape fabric, you're not going to be touching that soil anyways. Right. Awesome. Um, Cynthia Varampo, who is my mother, has a question. Hi, um, Grandma. <laughs> how do you pick the varieties of vegetables and plants that you plant? Uh, well, at first, when we first started doing it, it was just stuff that we knew. So, and then as we... Um, got deeper into it we do a lot of um planning so for us we look back every year like what sells and like what is selling and what is our big sellers mm -hmm. so we've gotten a general sense of what people want to eat and then that will direct us to what varieties we need to grow so what i'll say about that is the things that you want to eat those are the things that you would want to grow. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you try different varieties. So like years ago, when we learned about heirlooms. Yeah. And that changed my life. Like <laughs> they have yeah. so much flavor and the, you know, biggest problem even for us still is that people think that they're not very attractive because they have all the lumps and sometimes these little scars 
but they're so flavorful and um yeah so we changed the variety we eat less of the the slicing tomatoes regular um, rice. yeah they're bright red and perfectly round but we prefer the, the heirloom so it's also kind of getting to know trying new things um and if you do decide to try new things definitely start off small don't go major with it and see <laughs> if you like it different there's so many varieties of everything like cucumbers yeah you know the smaller ones that are more like your pickling cucumbers people prefer those over the bigger larger cucumbers so there's just so many things right. so i just i say try something new every year um and then you know see 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 how it uh chefs up how you chef it up and then you know decide whether or not you'll grow it again we also have another question. Um, are there any plants to watch out for because they're parasitic or can take over a plant bed? Squash, especially <laughs> when it's squash. I would say, but they're not so much. I wouldn't say it would be parasitic. It's just that they grow so big, they will shade out everything. Mm. Yeah, and just, um, they're usually, they're grow guides that you can get online. Um, to really determine how big a plant is. So then you automatically are gonna try to give it its, um, the best amount of space that it needs to grow. So like, again, tomatoes, you know, can be four feet, five feet tall and four feet wide. So you definitely wanna make sure when you're first, you know, planning out your beds, that you give that room in advance so that you're not having to figure it out. You know, collard greens, if it has enough room, the leaves can be humongous depending on what variety you have. Um, even regular summer squash, yeah. you know, the plant can get almost as big as like, <laughs> as this bed. So, wow. yeah. So it's just really kind of getting to know your plants and knowing how much space they need. So like you can Google like plant spacing. And sometimes you'll also find that on the back of a seed package yeah. um, or directly on the link of that company that sells, um, sells plants. They usually have a place you can go and figure out um, how much space plants need. Cool. Um, Christy Ridley from YouTube wants to know, what was the name of the plant that you mentioned earlier that was similar to quinoa and how do you prepare it? Oh, yeah. so what, what you guys might be seeing in your garden. So we grow different varieties. One is like a Jamaican variety that grows like 10 feet tall, but you might be seeing this. And if we were in the front, there's also a red one. So these are amaranth. They are of the amaranth family. And so is quinoa and they develop quinoa probably grows really really tall too and grows these massive seed they become really fuzzy and um they grow seed pod uh yeah this will be the seed pod um but yo it's really good so in what jamaica it's called kaulu and trinidad is called baji baji and in haiti it's called spinach so the interesting thing about that is it actually cooks down like spinach so it doesn't take very long to cook at all how we do it is really simple. Other people can add it to soups, but we basically... It's very simple. It's you cut up a little bit of onion, a little garlic, and a little butter. That's all you need. And then you chop up your car a little, saute it up for five minutes. Not even, like, yeah, five minutes, I would say, saute it all up. Mm -hmm. And you, you have a delicious meal right there. Maybe yeah. a little salt and pepper. That's all you need. Yep. Yeah, very simple. And recently I added um, squash. So I kind of, I like to layer flavors. So I kind of sauteed squash in a special kind of, kind of way that I like it. And then I actually added it to the kaolu and it, it was very complimentary. So it's it's very easy to cook. In it, and just remember it cooks down like um, really spinach. Fast. So yeah, 2.2 .2 seconds. We have a question from Emily Bach who wants to know, my tomato plants are now taller than the steaks and cages. Should I let them keep growing or should I cut them off at the top? <laughs> yeah, you might as well let them keep growing because you only got about till the end of this month. <laughs> oh, that's a... Sorry, we got a little distracted. <laughs> turkey vulture? Turkey that's a turkey vulture. There it goes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> distracted, for sure. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, you can definitely you know, let it keep growing. You can let it keep growing, and it that happens to us too, where it it grows over mm -hmm. the cost. And, but we don't mm -hmm. cut it back because um, it, you don't have that much more time on those plants, so you're better off just letting it grow over the cage, let it do what it do, and then get your fruit. Yeah, and what you what you could do is um, prune it. So I don't know if you already do that, but. 
usually where there's a leaf, I mean a stem, there's another stem that comes out the middle, which is called the sucker. Um, if you just remove that, you can pinch it off with your fingers, and then you just blow around your whole plant and find places there. Um, it's like under your armpit. It's like tomato, the armpit of a tomato. So like here is a sucker. It goes right in between the stems, and you just pinch that off. So you could definitely do a tremendous amount of pruning because once they um once they start to grow their uh, fruit, the energy in the leaves are not it's not taking up as much energy. So you could definitely take some some stems and leaves off. Oh, cool. The other thing about the suckers is that they are they can be a whole nother plant. So you do oh, want to yeah. actually pull those off because they end up turning into a whole nother tomato. Which is, is, is kind of cool. Good. And if you get really good at this, you can you actually can take one, it. replant it. Because like all these little hairy things on the tomatoes, they're the ones that turns into um, roots. So you could very well pop this thing in the ground, keep it watered, and eventually it'll be a whole new tomato plant. So the pits are plants too. That's awesome. We are, the pits are plants too. <laughs> Um, so speaking of our turkey vulture friend, Megan Wall. Oh, oh, no. question. How do you protect wild neighbors like rabbits and deer? Well, we have a slight technical difficulty. I'm sure they'll come back in a bit. <laughs> Here we go. We missed you guys a little bit. Did you hear my question? How do you protect from wild neighbors like rabbits and deer? Did you guys hear our question? How do we- No, we can't hear them. Hold on. Oh, okay. So while we're getting some technical difficulties figured out, if y'all have any more questions, please feel free to put them in the comments. Uh, I know we have a little bit more time, so We'll get to any last questions that you guys have. Can you hear me now? Oh, you guys are muted. That's why we can't hear you. Hey guys. There you go. Now Can we you see me here. Yeah. So we have a question. Yeah, so this is a little bit different here. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I didn't hear that question. That's okay. I will ask it again. We have a question from Megan Walsh Pizika who wants to know how do you protect from wild neighbors like rabbits and deer? All right, yeah, let's travel. Let's take a walk over to the building. I think we can go right here. We probably I don't know. Great. Can you hear us? Okay, okay. and we can hear yeah. you because I think you were you were. No, and I think it's because of our, our, our Wi-Fi. Internet. Yeah, now we can definitely hear you. Okay. Yeah, so our question was, how do you protect from wild neighbors oh, like rabbits and deer? Oh, now that's a tough for we because we really don't have <laughs> rabbits or deer. But um, what people have been doing is like putting cages or like um, chicken wire around their um, beds or around their grow area. And um, for deer, they actually put in six foot fencing for um, deer. We haven't, because we're in the city and we really don't have that many deer running around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only others, because uh, I haven't really experienced it, but for some rural farmers, they also find, and I don't know the names of plants, but perhaps you can Google um, kind of like bumper crops in a way. So basically things that deer like to eat, like outside the outdoor 
edges of your wherever you're at and then hopefully that'll discourage them from coming in deeper and something we're experienced with yeah and we have one last question for you guys um kathy kelly wants to know i have three raised beds can i use the same soil that's in there next year totally but what we're saying about that is, is that you can totally use the same soil that you have in there. But what we do is we add about two inches of soil every year or compost every year. Excellent. Great. So I think we're going to end that here. So Nataka and Bobby, thank you again for spending time with us this morning. I really appreciate it. How can folks engage with UFI after this field trip is over? Are there opportunities to work on the farm or other ways to engage with you guys? Yes, yeah, so we have some workshops that are coming up um, August 15th. We have our um, jams and jellies. I thought it was like a com concert, but it's really uh, <laughs> preserving jams for jams and jelly. Um, on the 15th, it'll be via Zoom. We do accept a few volunteers. Um, we usually don't do more than three, but we're trying to stretch it. We want to definitely want to be safe. Um, the other way is, yeah, our website, W minimally our Zoom um, workshop offerings. And then also find us on Facebook. We have lots of great posts of resources and cool articles. And then just, you know, pray for the future that soon, you know, you guys can actually come here and do a workshop. So we look forward to that. And we appreciate you guys tuning in and offering this opportunity for us to share what we do here at the Urban Farming Institute. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And um, as I said, please follow Urban Farming Institute on Facebook and Twitter. We'll post um, the links to some of the things that they were talking about in the comments. You can feel free to follow up with them. And for our viewers at home, thank you so much for tuning in for us, um, for your questions and your engagement. Please uh, like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube as well, so that way you can hear about the rest of our Backyard Farm to Table series that will be happening over the course of this month. Um, and you'll get updates about our next session, which is next week, um, from seed to fork. And it's a deep dive into the production, processing, and distribution of our food. So have a great rest of your day. Nataka and Bobby, stay cool, stay hydrated. You know, want to make sure you're taking care of yourselves. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care, everyone, and thanks for tuning in.